I think that there is a Facebookification, a Twitterification of art. Something that spreads really virally through the internet is seldom something that really makes you think. People like to think of art as purely being about good and somehow neutral, but art is never neutral. Our idea of art and what art should be has changed. Hi, I, I'm Lisa Caesar, and I am the Chief Operating Officer of No Studios. And I'm here today with uh, two uh, very important colleagues. I have Steve Rapp um, with, uh, I'm sorry, Steve Pond with The Rap. Steve is the awards editor at The Rap. Hi, Steve. How hey. are you? Good, and you? Um, I'm also joined by Maureen Bregali, who is the director of Generator Art. Generator is the administrator for the you know, Studios Artist Grant. So before we get started with these very important interviews, we're so excited to have four filmmakers here that have been recipients of the No Studios Artist Grant. I thought I would give a bit of a background on the No Studios Artist Grant and on critical content. So this is the second annual No Studios Critical Content series. And this is a virtual event where we focus specifically on the stories of uh, filmmakers um, and the, the movies that they've, that, and the films that they've made. The last year uh, during the pandemic, No Studios launched a uh, award series, a grant series. And in that series, we give away $100,000 per year to individual artists in all genres. In December of 2021, we awarded four filmmakers with an aggregate amount of $25,000 to complete their, their work. Um, the only major requirement that we have for these awards is that the artist must be living and working in Wisconsin. And so we're really thrilled and excited this year because the artists are, the filmmakers are all women. So um, that was just a really, uh, you know, fantastic outcome from my point of view. So uh, I wanted to bring Maureen in to just talk a little bit about the award process and how selective it is and how many applications there are to give folks a flavor for the depth and breadth of the artistic community in Wisconsin. Well, thank you, Lisa. Yes, we had over 100 applications for the filmmaker grants uh, with no studios, uh, and it was a very competitive application process. We had a jury of four film uh, professionals from outside Wisconsin who were on the jury, and they were reviewing all the applications. Uh, and first and foremost, they were looking for candidates uh, who were from traditionally underserved and underfunded artistic communities, including um, BIPOC creative professionals, female creative professionals, uh, disabled people, uh, veterans, um, and I'm sure I'm forgetting one or two more categories, uh, but they were really focusing on making sure that the funds were going to, to those creative professionals who had traditionally been underserved and underfunded. Um, and they were also reviewing the applications, looking at not only the quality of the work samples that were provided, but also thinking about the social impact of the, the work um, and thinking through uh, the impact that this grant would have on the filmmakers as well. Thank, thanks, Maureen. So it was a, a super fun process to go through, and the four women that achieved the award are exceptional. And so we're really thrilled to be able to partner again with The Wrap 
to be able to have a discussion with these filmmakers and review their process, their work, and also next projects. So Steve, I'm going to leave you with this fantastic project to speak with these four women um, and we'll we'll bring them in. I think we have a brief video that we're sh that will show um, as we introduce them. Um, and uh, thank you all for for joining us. Thanks. As, uh, as Lisa said, I'm Steve Bond from, from The Wrap, but I have my No Studios hoodie here, so, uh, so I'm ready to go. Um, welcome, welcome to all of you, and uh, you know, congratulations on, you know, on winning the grants and, and on making the great films that helped you win the grants. Um, so I, I know you all had very different paths into filmmaking, and so I, I just want to start by asking about that. Um, Mary Louise, let's let's start with you because you were a, a newspaper journalist for <laughs> eighteen years. Um, yeah. What, what took you from that into filmmaking, and and what was that transition like? Yeah. Well, thanks, Steve, um, and it's great to be here with all of you. Um, it was an unusual journey for sure. I think that my path to filmmaking came through just a question that I had, and I really felt that. Um, film was the right way to respond to this question. I wanted to understand what the world would be like without art critics in it, which is kind of where my current film began um, almost 10 years ago now. And I had been a newspaper journalist for a very long time. I had been an art critic for a period of time as well. And I, um, you know, was a videographer. I did a lot of video work for the newspaper. So I had sort of some basic skills. Um, but I really was getting into something I did not fully understand. And I don't know if I would do it today if I had to do it again. I mean, I, I, I often think about it as like I had the skills to write a sentence and I went off to, you know, do the equivalent of a novel. You know, I had these basic skills and set out to do something very ambitious. Um, one of the most basic things is, you know, as a journalist, you... Um, you try to get people to tell you things. You ask for information. You ask people to give their opinion, right? But you don't ask people to essentially reveal who they are in front of a camera, which is a very, very different kind of interviewing. So um, I had some very, very generous collaborators, some patient, wonderful collaborators and mentors along the way who really helped me figure out how to step into this medium. So Mark Escribano, who's in LA, and my editor, Jonathan Olson, these, these people have been just like insanely and amazingly patient and caring and like family and um, helping me kind of figure out how I will make films. So, yeah. Right. I mean, I, I, I feel like, you know, as, as somebody who spent, you know, 20, 30 years of myself in print journalism, you know, in the last 20 years or so, there's been this this feeling among most journalists I know. It's like, oh, what we're doing is kind of dying. Print print media isn't really, you know, a, a place to to thrive anymore. I mean, did you feel this the same way that, um, you know, and especially criticism is is really sort of, you know, being viewed as disposable because everybody can be a critic on on Twitter. Right. I mean, it's so limiting, right? Like the criticism for a hundred years was like this block of copy and a couple of images. And even as I was working at the newspaper, I really felt that there were so many different ways to kind of reach audiences, whether it was through social media platforms or video or all of these other kind of multimedia tools. So I had already kind of been that journalist. Like I was the one who like picked up all the new tools and was figuring that out. 
Um, but I will say, like, I really have this incredible appreciation for people who make films because it is a whole other level. It is a whole other species of, and I, you know, I wrote about film. I, I wrote about visual culture. So I should have known some of this, but I really do um, now see what, you know, I've been in this current project for 10 years. It's taken me a really long time to figure out how to make my first film. It's a very hard, um, it's a very hard thing to do to make a good film. And I really um, am super honored to be in the company of these other three women. And I've looked at your work and it's amazing. And um, yeah, it was a, a novel thing to do for a journalist, I think. Right. Um, Grace, how about, how about you? I mean, obviously your work has a strong activist bent to it. I mean, was that what what led you to want to make film? So actually my history, um, like mine is, uh, I, I started filmmaking across the Pacific. So I, I was originally from the Philippines and now I am a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And um, what really got me into filmmaking was this episode where one of the films that I created actually put an end or was instrumental in putting an end in a mining corporation's operation in one of the provinces in the Philippines. And that sort of reinforced my belief in the role, belief in the role of films to create movements for social impact. Um, and also I worked in the, um, for 10 years in the film industry. I worked in, you know, making films uh, with other creative collaborators in, um, in the US, in Japan, um, in India. And I really loved, um, you know, the, the, the collaborative, uh, what the, the collaborative, uh, how do you like, uh, how collaborative film is and how much you get to know yourself as well as others and other cultures. So um, because of that lengthy sort of 10 year experience, I, I am now, you know, doing my graduate studies in the, the university. And I've always thought of incorporating, you know, um, how, how my, my role as a scholar can inform my films and vice versa. Um, so yeah, that's basically what got me and what what had me, you know, stick with filmmaking and how I see film as a crucial tool um, to help others and also to get to know other people and get to know a lot about myself. So, mm -hmm. so, so were you making films in the Philippines before you came to the U.S.? Yes. Uh, so I was. Um, so my bread and butter was actually in uh, making uh, commercials. But aside from that, I wanted, I was very interested in making films about communities, collaborating with communities and, you know, um, asking communities about their needs. And I didn't want to, you know, impose my own ideologies in these communities. So I always had, you know, conversations with them. What do they need? How can they use this medium that I am very much familiar with to help them um, raise awareness about their concerns, their issues, their plight, and how we can all use this um, to empower and give voice to, you know, the underrepresented uh, communities and then how I can bridge that with the people here in the U.S. and especially in Wisconsin. So, Right. Um, yeah, I feel like, you know, Sophia and Janelle, I feel like you come not so much from the, the world of activism or journalism, but more from, you know, experimental film and, and art. I mean, Sophia, what, what led you to, to filmmaking? Um, thanks, Steve. Yeah, I mean, I definitely came to film because I'm someone with a diversity of interests. Um, and for me, it provides a space where I can incorporate research, uh, poetics, um, interest in photography, art history. And like much like Grace was saying, a strong drive for me in working in film is how it is just implicitly about conversation and community building. So even though Janelle and I, you know, we're from the same small community um, related to UWM's program, it's very much, we work in, I work, at least I'll speak for myself as like a small gauge artist filmmaker. I make most of my things almost entirely myself from the shooting, editing process, writing, um, but, it's still always about conversation. It's always about um, community building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, 
at what point, you know, were, were you working in other arenas and then decided to get to get more into film or was film always a, a strong interest? Um, it's always been a, a strong interest of mine, but I would say I started off um, as more of a photographer. I worked a lot in collage practices and both um, in, with language and with visuals, and then that translated for me naturally into discovering experimental film and, you know, kind of the key figures within that movement who sort of showed me that this was something I could do. Um, that I was allowed to make something entirely start to finish on my own terms. Um, but yeah, I worked in the production uh, side of things, like in the film industry in New York for a number of years before coming to UWM and really getting to focus on my own individual practice. So I've seen, I've seen all sides, um, but yeah, it's always, it's always been my, my space. Right. Janelle, how, how about you? What was what was your journey into filmmaking like? Yeah, um, so I definitely came to film uh, from kind of an intermedia art background. Uh, it's, it's kind of funny if I think back and chart uh, how I thought about the questions that I was parsing through and the materials that I was using. Um, it kind of followed a 2D, 3D, 4D model. I started out painting the things and then I was making things as a sculptor and a ceramicist. And then I started performing with the things that I was making and I started filming those performances. So that's actually kind of the trajectory that got me to working predominantly with time-based media, with video. And um, as Sophia mentioned, um, I also work in a uh, small gauge 16 millimeter film as well. Um, so as an artist, uh, I think, one of the one of the things that drew me to the arts and drew me to film and, and time-based media in particular um, was the opportunity just to be curious about everything. Um, I, I loved the sciences, and my films are thinking about how you know plants can interact with humans, can interact with um, geologies and landscapes. Uh, so the arts allowed for me to consider how the world was and also imagine how it could be different. Um, so what a, what a lot of my um, colleagues and peers have mentioned so far is that uh, there's an opportunity to, to change the world. There's an opportunity to uh, intervene in systems that aren't working anymore. Mm -hmm. And there's an opportunity to create dialogue and to build community. Um, so those are some of the reasons why uh, I do what I do. Um, and I think film is one of the most interdisciplinary intermedia modes for creative production possible. Um, I also, work, uh, I'm going to use the, the term as a total filmmaker, meaning that I write the script, I film, I sometimes perform in, I edit, I do sound work, I do all aspects of my workflow. Um, there are times when I collaborate, but in general, that's kind of how I work. And that allows me to maintain that curiosity um, to, you know, get my hands dirty and work with materials um, and then also have moments where I'm editing in Premiere. So that kind of avid curiosity that brought me to the arts in the first place continues to be fed uh, through time-based media, video and film. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, do you, do you feel like the film time-based media satisfies what what you want to do in a way that you know 2d and, and 3d didn't i mean was this was a progression to to this to this level yes um i i really appreciate that question because i i do still paint i do still make things from time to time but i think the the question or the set of thematic interests that motivated that jump into the deep end of the 4d of the film of the video was the fact that i was really curious um 
about uh, presence and absence and interventions in time. So film, video, um, they, they allowed for play in those moments, quite obviously, in a way that potentially I couldn't ask my audiences to do when working with a 3D object or with a painting. Um, it, it seemed like a much more direct way uh, to approach my presence and my spectators' presence um, and kind of intervene in those moments. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, I feel like part of the purpose of these grants is to support people from communities that are traditionally underrepresented in the world of, of film and television and, and visual media. I mean, I wonder for all of you, when you were, you know, growing up watching movies, watching TV, I mean, did you feel like, did you find yourselves represented? And, and when you got into this, did you feel like you had to battle for for a place at the table in a in a you know environment that obviously has been dominated by white males, um, Mary Louise. Uh, wow, that's a a big loaded question. It's a good one. Um, yeah, I I will say that um, I found my way to journalism instinctually, and then I found my way into film instinctually as well, and. Um, you know, it is, I think, I'll just be honest, a struggle sometimes to assert one's voice in certain places within the world of journalism. I think that it's a male dominated space a lot of the time. Um, and so I, I came out of that tradition, um, growing up, I don't know that I had, it took me a while to find journalism for that reason. I think there weren't a ton of people who I saw doing the kind of work that I wanted to do. Um, I will tell you that I um, work with a lot of women. When I, when I left journalism and got to um, create my own team, that was a very meaningful process to me, to be able to kind of literally decide who are the people who share values, who I really want to work with. And it turns out there were a, a lot of women. I loved the days when I was on set with 100% women and, um, and lots of people of color as well. I, I do feel like, especially dealing with the subject of culture and our criticism, which is very white and very male, um, bringing that kind of community around the subject um, mattered a lot to me. So I don't know if that answers your question, but um, it has been a struggle um, sometimes to locate my voice and all of that. And uh, I do feel like working on this film, this latest film has been a really important journey for me in that regard. Mm -hmm. Right. Grace, how about, how about you? I mean, I, I would think that the, you know, the, a lot of your, your work seems to involve ind indigenous communities and Philippines, which typically are not represented in, 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 you know, media that we see. Yeah, for sure. Like, um, living in the Philippines, I, you know, I grew up watching films, um, Hollywood films and different types of films and international films. And I saw how Asians and Filipinos were portrayed in the films. Um, and most of the time I either were not actually in incorporated in these, um, in the, these types of, um, medium but we're also misrepresented. Um, and so it was, it became sort of my drive to become a filmmaker and, you know, say that, okay, I, I want to make a difference. I want to um, legitimize my voice. I want to be heard. I want our, our um, like, I want Asians to have our own voice in, in, in film. And I, and also I worked on sets, like not just in the Philippines, but also in other in other countries, and I struggled a lot, you know, with a male-dominated industry. Um, I worked, you know, as an assistant director and as an editor, and so I experienced a lot of these struggles and how I would navigate it, how how I would navigate these male-dominated spaces, and how, um, you know, I could use my voice and my skills and talents um, to actually um, co-create these spaces, these safe and brave spaces where, you know, we can be seen um, and, um, you know, use this to better represent, um, you know, Filipinos and Asians in particular. So, yeah, um, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Sophia, what, what about you? I mean, did you, you know, have to work to the get to get to the point in in this industry where you know you could you could write, you could direct, you could assemble these movies, and you know, as you said, you did them sort of yourself in a lot of cases. Yeah, I mean, I think everything that um, you know has been said is entirely relevant um, to this question. It's such a big question. Uh, for me, it was mostly applicable in just wanting to get my hands on the camera and have like full uh, authorship in that way, feel like the camera was an extension of my own body, um, my sensorial experience and be able to express myself through a camera rather than feeling like cinematography was something that was off limits to me. Um, or that was like just so specialized that I couldn't be um, have mastery over it. And so that's part of why I work in the way that I work is that um, it allows me, I'm kind of an anti-mastery maker, but it allows me to feel like I have um, a say from beginning to end. Um, but also in my practice, I'm very focused on conversation and, and shining a light on sort of micro history. So highlighting just like super small elements of people's lives um, and life experiences and um, allowing that to speak for itself rather than painting in broad strokes. Um, so for me, that's a form of reclamation through personal cinema. Yeah. Um. Janelle, do you have anything to add to, to this obviously very large question? It is a very large question. Uh, I, when you asked it, I was thinking back, like, you know, as a, as a young girl, what was my perception of who made films or who got to have a say? And I, I do think growing up, it, it seemed like something that was very masculine and that men did. Um, so to... I'm trying to think if there was a specific moment where I realized I could, um, but it, it definitely feels subversive at times uh, to to be able to to write my stories and to to show what I want to show with a camera uh, or with a soundscape. Um, I I also find it quite interesting that um, all of us gathered here today have been talking a lot about um, community building, um, and I think that's one of the delightful things that occurs specifically when you have a, a woman who is a director or a woman who has a lot of creative choice uh, on a film, it, it stops being kind of a product oriented outcome based thing and it's more processual. Um, so I guess that's what I would offer to this aspect of the conversation is that's one of the things that I find um, unique or um, that that tends to happen more uh, when women are directing and writing um, and yeah. have great creative say. Yeah, okay. I, I want to get into just talking about the specific challenges of, of your, that you've encountered in your individual work. Um, I mean, Mary Louise, in, in your, you know, in in that move from, from print to film on, on your, you know, your art critics, movie i mean are there specific things that that you weren't expecting that you found you know very challenging and and how'd you deal with them that's a really good question um there are so many things i feel like i can make a list of about 100 <laughs> things that are different and were challenging um i will say maybe one thing that kind of rises to the top is just the relationship that i have with subjects so as a journalist, you there is a level of caring for the relationship that you have with your sources, right? You, you protect your sources, you respect your sources, you're ethical with them. Um, there's a little bit of a, a formal remove, however, um, as a print journalist, as a newspaper journalist, as a mainstream journalist, where you know you are kind of serving the masthead, you're serving your your publication, and. I think what I came to realize over time about film is that what I'm asking of people is so much more. You know, there is something extractive about film um, that goes above and beyond uh, what you're asking of a subject when you call them on the phone to 
talk to them for a feature or a, an article for the newspaper. Um, when you're asking someone to live their life in front of your camera, to be who they are in front of your camera, you have to give them so much more of yourself too. And that relationship, um, I've really come to think of this as a form of care. I actually think of filmmaking as a form of care. If turning that camera on somebody and focusing on their life, you are asking so much of them um, and you give them, you have to give them a lot in return. And that might mean um, much more muddy waters in terms of like the line between, um, you know, that, that hard remove that you have as a, as a journalist is not as applicable when you're making a film. You actually have to tell your sources much more, your subjects much more about who you are, what your intentions are. Um, you have to be in a different kind of relationship. And so that was that was a big, you know, it took me a while to, to kind of develop my own thinking on that. And I feel like I've come to that, but that was, that was a big, big shift for me, for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Grace, what about what about you? I mean, what what are the particular challenges of of the kind of filmmaking you've done? So a lot of the the projects that I've actually created are very uh, lengthy. So the last one that I created was an eight year documentary film about an indigenous um, person in the Philippines. Um, so it was very challenging at first because number one, I was a beginner filmmaker back then. I didn't have financial support. And you know, when you're creating documentaries or re when you're creating projects, yeah, you need um, finances to be able to pull off you know, a, a very outstanding or a very um, polished work. So that was one of the challenges, just finding the right, you know, resources and also pitching it in different events like um, like film grants um, and all that and also aside from like you know the financial hurdles you there is also that kind of um, problem in terms of, I wouldn't say it uh, I wouldn't say it's a problem problem but there's this um, you get too involved with your protagonists or your characters, especially when I created this eight year film. A lot of the times, um, you know, the, the characters would consult me about their domestic issues. And sometimes, you know, as a documentary filmmaker, you didn't want to be involved in their problems. So that was kind of one of the challenges that I had to deal with, like, you know, oscillating your role between a documentary filmmaker as a storyteller and also as a friend. Um, there would be a lot of times when I would, because it's a lengthy process, um, you know, you question your intentions or your motivations on creating this film. Is this film, you know, going to be able to help them better their circumstances or would it just, you know, further your career? Um, so those are some of the struggles, like internal struggles. But at the end of the day, you know, um, I tell myself, what is your main intention in creating these types of films? Is it just for you or you know is it is there a need as a storyteller and for those communities for their stories for their significant stories to be heard and to be seen by the world out there um so yeah there's a lot of you know um thinking and trying to marry your personal as well as you know the community's problems so what else are some of the challenges so yeah getting too involved um yeah um and also just building that kind of rapport and relationship with um you know your protagonist or your characters for these documentaries are some of the challenges that i faced in you know creating some of the projects that i have um made right um sophia how about how about you i mean i see some of your work it's it's such an intricate work of collage that, that i sort of sit there and think how can you keep keep it straight and and know you know know what what you're what you're aiming for <laughs> yes that's a very good way of putting it steve um yeah i mean i would say as for me as a maker the primary challenge is always just accepting that any subject is going to be uncontainable and that's the reason that i'm addressing it um or like if i'm trying to make a portrait of a person um then i'm never going to succeed at making a complete portrait and that kind of unknowability um, and uncontainability ends up being you know what drives my practice um, but it's also the challenge um, just constantly 
adding, I'm a very like additive maker. Um, and that's a way of constantly complicating what I'm going after uh, so that it is never just pat, just too simple. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Janelle, how about you? I mean, obviously your work, your work is, you know, is similarly adventurous in the way it deals with with narrative. So what are the challenges for you of, of doing that? Yes. Uh, so in my films, often the actors are not human. Uh, <laughs> I'm using frame by frame uh, stop motion animation, time lapse, um, a lot of different temporal interventions to allow the natural motion of um, plants and rocks and fungi mm -hmm to show up on screen. So one of my big uh, struggles, and I say struggle kind of with an asterisk because it's one of the big pleasures is to figure out how in the world these plants are going to, to react to the things that I'm asking them to do. And um, I say it's a pleasure because the goal of my work is to imagine inhuman alternatives to how humans relate to plants and to the environment. Um, so as I, I stop myself a lot of times when I'm in the studio and I'm getting frustrated or this just isn't working and I stop myself and I'm like, this is, this is exactly what my work is, is asking of me and of us. So those are actually really beautiful moments where I get to slow down <laughs> and try to step outside of, of my, my human limitations for a moment and say like, okay, what, what is this plant trying to teach me? Um, you know, in this moment, how can I relate more ethically? Um, and that, what I just said there is another um, problem as well. I'm a human <laughs> trying, to, trying to step outside myself for a moment and, and think about what interspecies communication could look like, um, what interspecies influenced um, environmental action and ethics could look like. And I inherently can't do that. So I'm, I'm constantly meeting the, the limitations of my human brain and my, my you know, community-based, civilization-based um, training a lot. Uh, so those are some of, I'll use the word limitations. Those are some of the limitations that I encounter uh, when making my work. It, it also is often site-specific. Um, in one of my most recent films, A Valley Without Trees, I was climbing, you know, extinct volcanoes. Um, <laughs> in Arizona and it was hot and it was rocky and there were snakes and um, it, it was it was a lot. So physically there's um, some limitations there as well. Right. Hey there, at least they're extinct volcanoes, right? Exactly, right. Or are they? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, obviously there's a there's a challenge that everybody has been facing for the last two years, which is, you know, which is the reason we're doing this on on, you know, in little windows rather than at, at no studios in, in Milwaukee. I mean, did any of you have any of you had to dramatically change what you've been doing with your films because of because of COVID? And you know, every, anybody is is welcome to to speak up on on this one. I can well, start. Um, so when I was talking about animation. Uh, you know, not being able to um, film on location or with human beings, uh, actually that was a limit that guided me uh, to, to using animation much more fully in my work. It had showed up before um, and there definitely was a focus on the inhuman in my previous works, but 2020 marked a moment where I was like, okay, what is a workflow that can be sustainable right now? Um, and in, in some ways that was a really, I don't want to say helpful moment, but it was, it was a good choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mary Louise did, did, you know, dealing with COVID change what you could do in, in your film? It did very much. I mean, we were sort of at the very end of production on a film we've been working on for a long time. And, 
Um, we are working in a lot of cities across the country. So I, uh, we all got COVID compliance officer training, a bunch of us on our team. And um, we ended up working with local teams in 10 different cities. And I literally got in my Volkswagen Beetle and traveled all over the country to, um, to direct these shoots in these various places. So I slept at a lot of um, campgrounds and truck stops. I took a lot of truck stop showers along the way, which is actually really a lovely experience. It sounds terrible. It's really great after you've been in the car for 48 hours to like pay $12 and get a warm shower. And um, even before, you know, vaccinations were available, we were, we were really careful. We quarantined mm -hmm. and we took a lot of care and took care of each other and our subjects and kind of just went forward because we felt that we kind of had to in order to get this film across the finish line. So yeah, it was a big, it was a big shift and it did slow us down. Like there are certain things we just could not do in COVID. Um, so our timeline got a little stretched out, um, but we were able to go forward and um, it was definitely an adventure <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've heard of living out of a VW van, but a Beetle is something else entirely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Grace, were you, were you affected by it? Yes, definitely. Like, so I am currently um, developing a another film um, from a short documentary film. It became a feature because I, back then I had this narrative in mind and it was time sensitive. But because of COVID, I couldn't travel a lot. So I had to like sit down with my producer and think about, OK, how do we reframe the narrative in order to still tell the story? But, you know, we will be able to you will miss a, a significant event. So a lot of, you know, rethinking and reframing about the narrative and the structure. And also, um, I think uh, with with everything that's happening, we, I had to like take a break and pause and think about what really matters as, as, as of the moment. Is it to, you know, finish the film or, you know, think about um, your mental health, you know, um, people's health and everything. So it was also, you know, very um, significant in terms of thinking about what um, truly matters at this moment. Yeah, yeah. so that's how it, uh, the whole thing, the pandemic affected the projects that I am I am currently developing. Yeah, um, right. Sophia, did you have? I'm. I'm wait. Yeah. I mean, it was definitely. It's. It continues to be a challenge, especially as an educator. Um, but I guess I would say, uh, I mean, I'm not interested in trying to put a positive spin on the pandemic uh, because it's been awful and continues to be, but. Uh, for me as a maker, it forced me to think about other ways of forming interconnected bonds um, when not in person. So as someone who makes as a way of having conversations, I had to uh, extend that to distance making. So the last film I made is um, sort of following on a trajectory of making films that involve uh, epistolary correspondences. And so I ended up... Um, sort of requesting that a lot of friends send me letters um, and we kind of made collaborative epistolary projects uh, as a way of dealing. Um, so that was that was the turn that it, it took me in and I'm grateful for that because yeah, I found other ways of closeness at a distance. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I know these grants are designed to help you going forward. So let's talk about Talk about going forward. Um, you know, what's what's the next project you're working on, or what are you finishing now, Mary Louise? Do you have something beyond the art critics film, or are you still? Is that is that what you're doing in the future? Is finishing that one? Yeah, I mean, my big project right now is to get this film completed. <laughs> um, so our hope is to have it edited by um, uh, late spring, early summer, and that's my primary focus right now. I do also continue to write. Um, I'm no longer with the newspaper that I um, was my home for 18 years, but I do um, a little bit of freelancing. And, you know, there's sort of an open question for me about what happens after this film is done. I mean, I, I kind of hope that, you know, it might show up at some festivals, but beyond that, I really would love for this film to show up in like 
small art galleries and art schools and sort of smaller community-based contexts where it can, you know, spark a conversation in a place like Billings, Montana about like, you know, what does it mean to have somebody who is around and paying attention to what artists are doing in, in a community space, right? So I kind of imagine that will take up, you know, some time going forward. And it, it is a question for me whether my my own professional life will be, you know, will take the form of film or writing or some combination of those things. And I'm just sort of taking one step at a time and, and feeling my way through that. Right. Um, so are, have you shot everything for for the film or are you, so it's all in the editing stages now? Exactly, we're, we're basically done with production and we are um, shifting. We've been editing of course all along and we're kind of um, hip deep now in post-production mode. Yeah. Right. Grace, what about you? What's next? So currently I am developing um, a personal film about my, my parents, my family. So they were part of the underground movement in the Philippines during the dictatorial regime um, in the Philippines during the 1970s and the 1980s. And you know how the US was very much involved in this. So this project is, you know, it's very personal, but at the same time, it examines the history sort of the Cold War and how you know neo-colonialism has shaped and informed a lot of the experiences of Filipinos in the Philippines as well as in the US. So that is my next project. Hopefully it comes out in the next couple of years, um, not in the next eight years, a pre uh, just like the previous one, but hopefully it finishes soon. But yeah, that's the next project that I have. Right. Sophia, what about you? Um, well, I'm working on a follow-up to my last film, Other Title Effects. Um, this is also a film that's kind of engaged in somatic approaches to filmmaking to explore um, or trying to portray or, um, yeah, conceive of portraying epileptic rhythms through filmmaking. Um, and so I'm working on that, which is also uh, yeah, shot on 16 millimeter, and I'm intending it to be made for a multi-channel installation. Um, and all of the shots kind of revolve around 360 um, pans. Uh, so I'm very excited about that and hopefully finding a venue for it. Um, I've also been experimenting with creating scent scores, so making uh, olfactive fragrance-based scores for my films. My last film featured um, my EEG readout as an electronic score. So I'm trying to kind of go into a scent realm of scoring. Um, and then I'm also working on a really exciting collaboration with another Milwaukee filmmaker, Grace Mitchell. Um, that's an experimental narrative uh, told in vignettes and parking lots. So we're hoping to get some funding for sound mixing for that. Uh, we're almost done shooting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Janelle, what about you? Uh, so the film that I completed most recently, A Valley Without Trees, is uh, set at volcanoes in what we know of as the American Southwest. And um, that area of the, the country, that geography, um, has always been very interesting to me, um, kind of indicative of human intervention in spaces um, and representative of our, our questioning <laughs> presence uh, in the world. So A Valley Without Trees is, is the first in what will be a series of short 16 millimeter films set at these dormant super volcanoes. Um, so that's kind of the short term goal. Um, and that's one of the, the main things that this uh, grant will help me with. Um, and then kind of longer term, I'm also thinking about um, another 16 millimeter film focused on uh, Hildegard von Bingham, who was a, a nun in uh, Germany, Austria, that area, who uh, thought about plant sentience in a very interesting way. And she 
for this film will function as uh, the entrance to this dialogue, but she's not the focus. The focus is actually um, this monastery that she founded um, and the community that grew up there and that has um, developed uh, with the plants in this area of Germany. So I'm very much thinking about um, interspecies communities and what happens when certain elements are removed either through anthropogenic climate change or uh, something else and, and what occurs in that instance. So uh, that's definitely a longer term goal and I'm thinking about uh, uh, funding and how that would work currently. Right. Um, well, let's go to some some audience questions here. I may have to scoot a little closer to my computer screen, but um, here's one jumping off of Grace's comments. What did you learn about yourself while making your film? Um, mm. Grace, I mean, making a, a movie that's as personal as the one you're you're working on now. I mean, what does it teach you about yourself? Um, definitely. Like a lot of, a lot of the, for this one that I'm currently developing about my family, it, 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 it helps me to know about my roots, my history, um, and you know, how, um, how, uh, colonialism also has impacted a lot of the experiences that I've, um, I've been experiencing in the past couple of years in the Philippines and also in the U.S. Also, like the the one that I've previously done, the eight year uh, documentary about this indigenous man in the Philippines, that taught me a lot about you know being sensitive about other people's needs, um, and not just you know furthering the creation of the documentary. It taught me how to um, you know yeah, as I mentioned, being uh, how to be sensitive. Um, towards, you know, if they wanted to be filmed, when when do I just be in the moment? When do I um, take my camera out and, you know, um, record everything that's holding in front of me in order to develop the, the narrative that, you know, I wanted to create. So a lot of it, you know, is, uh, is a lot about um, being patient and being in, being in the moment. So yeah, those are some of the things that I learned um, regarding the filmmaking process or the the films that I've created. Right. Um, anybody else want to want to offer you know what you've learned about yourself while making films? I mean, I think I'm constantly learning about myself through the process of making art, um, and it's part of why I do it. Um, it expands my, you know, attention to the world, much like Grace was saying, it expands the way that I'm aware of my impact on other people. Um, and as someone who makes like pretty exclusively personal films, I, I often have to think about the balance between, you know, um, you know, what is the fictional element of my work and, and what, you know, what's a construction and, um, what's, nonfiction and constantly thinking about that line is something that has become of great interest to me uh, the longer I'm making these films. Um, yeah, I can right. go on. <laughs> okay. Um, well, here's, here's another, another question. Do you have any other practices or hobbies that you feel contribute to your filmmaking process? Mary Louise, I, su I suppose, that, you know, I don't think journalism is, is a hobby, but but obviously <laughs> it contributes strongly to, to your filmmaking process, I would think. It, it does. I, I was just um, reflecting on the last question that, you know, I spent so much time in my career paying such very close attention to the work that artists do, right? And, and the visual work that they do and kind of the subtlety that they do, but through objects, you know, without that much connection actually to the artists behind that. And I mean, that was, you know, like so much of my focus was literally on these, these things that artists would put out into the world. And I think when I started working on a film, I really went at it with like a journalistic, like matter of factness, like I'm just going to turn the camera, I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to ask the questions. And it took me a long time to realize, like, I need to figure out how I want to make films, <laughs> you know, like what is the style of filmmaking? What, what kind of presence does the camera have in the room? What kind of, you know, um, mode am I going to be in? And, and that was definitely something I had to learn for myself. And it's also, I think, um, 
a way that I leaned upon eventually, you know, those skills that I had as an art critic, somebody who literally thought about visual things for so long, I was able to kind of go back into that well and think about, you know, putting my own things out into the world and what that would look like. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anybody else drawing on your, your hobbies or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or interests in, in making your films? I guess for me, what, what you know, what uh, contributes to my filmmaking process is, you know, I, I like to converse with a lot of people. I like to, you know, just sit in a cafe and, you know, talk to other people or observe people. And that, that, that informs a lot of the, the conversations that are included in my film. Also, you know, as part of, um, uh, as part of academia, uh, my, the theories that I learned in school inform a lot of the practice or a lot of the films that I create and vice versa. So connections and the theories, these are like some of the things that inform um, the films that I do. Right, okay. Well, I think here's here's an audience question that I think would, would be a good one, a, another big question, but a good one to to wrap up on, which is what is what is the impact you hope to see as a result of your film, or films? Um, so um, let's just let's just go around the the group here and and um, you know see if we can come up with answers to that, um, Mary Louise. Uh, sure. Also, very big question. Um, so I guess, you know, like I said, when I started the, the film I'm working on right now, which is called Out of the Picture, I really was thinking about um, art criticism and its demise, like it's going away. And what I never expected to see was um, the worlds of both media and art so transformed during the, the 10 years that our cameras rolled. And that's something that we have all lived through. And I, I really do believe that visual culture is sort of coming into all of our lives. Um, you know, the, the tools that belong to the artist um, are no longer rare. They are in all of our hands. We are all producing visual culture all the time. And I really believe that the humans who are kind of really keeping up with that and are thinking about the art world is not just what's tucked away in the art museum and the gallery, but is also the memes that are through it, flowing through our devices, the, the, the actions that are happening around um, Confederate monuments, the, the protests that are happening in the streets and the visual culture that goes along with those, the, the, you know, the pussy hat, for example. Um, the, the critics who are really keeping up with that are a different kind of critic. They're not like the critics of 20 or 30 years ago. They're very interesting. Um, and they are helping us really understand the way that culture is shaping the way we see the world and each other more than ever. And so my hope is that people will just get interested in the amazing humans that are in our film who do this work well, who have risen in the time that we've been shooting them to be some of the most important voices on culture today, um, that they will you know, be Googling all of them and reading them and, and um, thinking about the questions that um, are provoked by what they do. Right. Grace, what, what do you hope to accomplish? So for me, um, I, I hope that the viewers, you know, from, from the films that I've, I'm creating, I hope that they realize sort of that the, the power, um, that they, that we have in, uh, to make an impact on, you know, other people's lives. And, you know, no matter what kind of career you pursue, whether it's, you know, making poetries or making visual arts or making films, um, for as long as you just, this might sound cheesy, but, um, for as long as you just strive to have a positive impact on other people's, then you're in fact, you know, creating those uh, tiny ripples of change. Um, and I guess, you know, looking back, in uh, my eight year journey in um, in my previous film, it just reinforced my understanding of, you know, how exploitative our system works. And that, you know, if we, um, we that we can never truly uh, achieve positive change if we don't address the very source or the very root of people's oppression. And if we constantly, you know, vote for, 
the people um, who perpetuate the the interests of the ruling class people like nothing will, positive will come out of it so yeah those are some of the things that i hope my films would um make an impact on so, yeah. right yeah sophia what what kind of impact are you looking for um well i would say with all of my films um but specifically the most recent one other title effects which um, for those in the audience who haven't seen it, it's kind of using uh, experiences of disassociation that I have um, and trying to translate them unsuccessfully through various uh, audio and image tactics. Um, I'm interested in, you know, creating a space of extreme nuance for the viewer that provokes uh, questioning and conversation. And that's pretty much why I, I make films is, um, to make these, you know, gaps that people have to fill in and, and ask each other about and ask themselves about, um, and just provoke a form of attention, um, which I think is, yeah, one of the most important roles of art in our culture. So I hope right. people pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> um, Janelle, what about you? Um, so in my, you know, effort to imagine different ways that, you know, interspecies communication and collaboration can occur. Uh, I am very interested in kind of rewriting that aspect of environmental film, just to consider what our human impact on the environment and on the world has been. Um, they can be very serious. Um, they can be a bit didactic. And I'm really interested in bringing humor and joy and weirdness to that conversation. And my hope with that affect change uh, is that potentially audiences that may not go to a gallery or to a museum space um, may be interested in these films. So I'm hoping to uh, have quite a wide reach. I'm interested in um, forming communal bonds with folks who may not normally you know, traffic spaces uh, where where films are shown. And ultimately it's about creating dialogue. I'm not interested in telling people what to do, but I am interested in creating that space for them to talk. And as an extension of my filmmaking practice, I also um, curate a, a screening series in a cinema space called A Cinema. Um, during the pandemic, we're online at www.acinema.space. So if you wanna check out our programming, Go right ahead and join the dialogue there. Okay, well, we could obviously keep talking for a long time about um, all of this, you know, all of these fascinating films and 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 subjects. But um, I think we need to wrap up. I I would like to add on a on a personal note that you know we've talked about community here, and and I feel like you know no studios. What John and Lisa have have done is a you know is a real important sense of, of making a community there. And I was delighted to, to go there back when we could. Um, and, you know, as a representative of the RAP, I'm delighted to be, we're part of, of the series this week. So um, thank you all. And um, thank you for terrific films and a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.